All right. Hello and welcome back to the Hands on IT podcast. I'm your host, Landon Miles, and this month we're diving into automation and focusing on safe and accessible automation, which has always been a key theme for us here at Automox. Previously, we defined IT automation as utilizing software to solve problems repeatedly and consistently, from installing software and applying patches automatically to enforcing desired states on hundreds, if not thousands of endpoints. Automation is one of IT's most powerful tools. However, like any tool, its effectiveness hinges on understanding how and where to use it. While many tools can function as a hammer, uh, a hammer may not always function as any other tool. The same is true of automation. Now, before we start, I'd like to talk about depth of understanding uh, by making an analogy to Legos. With Legos, some people might be fascinated by the chemical makeup, manufacturing process, logistics behind Legos, but for me, I just like to build things with them. Um, I feel the same way about technical concepts. People want to dive deep into how it works, and I'm always like, cool, cool, but when can I play with it or where can I use it? Uh, so with the concepts I'm going to throw at you in this podcast today, we won't go super in-depth regarding how they do what they do. Instead, I want to focus on some of their practical use cases uh, and how automation can help you in your day-to-day -day tasks. So first, let's demystify some of the buzzwords associated with automation, starting with one of the most misunderstood terms, algorithm. So the term algorithm often gets thrown around in technical and non-technical discussions. YouTube's algorithm, social media recommendation algorithms, Google's search algorithm, but what exactly is an algorithm? So I just started reading algorithms by Panos Loritas, which is part of the MIT Press Essential, Not Essential Knowledge series. And it's a really interesting read and I highly recommend it. Uh, Loritas defines algorithms this way. He says, algorithms are specific ways to solve problems through a sequence of steps. So in other words, an algorithm is a set of instructions or rules that are followed to solve a problem. One of my favorite points in the book is that digital technology is enabled as much by its hardware, the physical components that make up computers and digital devices, as by its software, the programs that run on it. So the backbone of programs are the algorithms that they implement. So there are a lot more intricacies to creating, designing, and deploying algorithms, but this is the Hands-On IT podcast. We're here to apply things and not to theorize about them, a lesson I learned by falling asleep in way too many calculus classes. So let's stick with defining an algorithm as a reproducible set of steps to solve a problem. In the context of automation, algorithms allow us to automate repetitive tasks consistently and efficiently. When it comes to a specific algorithm, it's often helpful to think what problem is being solved. For example, a social media algorithm is designed to show you items you may find interesting by looking at the data it's already stored about you in its platform. The algorithm solves this problem by showing you things it's pretty sure you'll find interesting, so you'll spend more time using the service. One of the best things about computers is that they don't get bored executing repetitive tasks and they can execute algorithms very quickly with a seemingly infinite amount of data points. So how does all of this relate to automation? Well, automation is built on algorithms. The algorithm is the holder of the logic behind the automation. It's the holder of the sequence and steps and evaluations you want to take place. The next thing is the programming language. Now, you don't hear as much about programming languages as you do about algorithms, but they're also an important tool in your automation tool belt. So if an algorithm is a reproducible set of steps to solve a problem, programming is the art of conveying these steps to a computer in a way that the computer can understand and execute. Programming languages are sets of symbols and syntax used to communicate with computers. There are many languages and each suited for different tasks, but they all share similar principles. You've got PowerShell, Bash, Python, C++, C, C Sharp, Perl, Ruby, and many more. A quick Wikipedia search shows over 700 programming languages exist. These languages allow us to write specific instructions for the computer to carry out. 
Now, many programming languages are hardware or operating system specific. And with so many languages out there, it can be difficult to pick one to start with. Python is a great one for beginners and can help you get the fundamentals down. As a bonus, it's the only programming language that I know of named after Monty Python's Flying Circus. So the Python programming language is named after Monty Python's Flying Cir Circus, which was a BBC comedy series from the 1970s. So Guido Van Rossum, the Dutch programmer who created Python in 1991, was a big fan of the show and wanted a name that was short, unique, and slightly mysterious. So while he was developing the language, he was also reading the published scripts from the show. Uh, and many Python examples and tutorials also include jokes from the show. So once you begin to understand the basics of one programming language and the logic behind developing algorithms to solve problems within your scripts, jumping to another programming language is much easier. But the good news is that with the advent of no code and low code solutions, you don't have to know any of these by heart to be able to automate because there are a lot of tools out there to enable you to automate. So no code and low code solutions are platforms that allow users to create automated processes without having to write any complex code. So this is great and the advances in these types of technologies help to bring the benefits of coding to the masses. So no code or low code solutions add easy to use interfaces over complex code. Uh, the software allows you to automate easily by specifying your algorithmic parameters in an easy to understand graphical interface. Instead of typing lines of code, you can just point and click. While these tools can be helpful, they do have limitations and aren't always able to handle more complicated tasks. But for many automation needs, they work just fine. So one thing I am always looking for when using these tools is the ability to edit the code manually. While this may sound counterintuitive, sometimes the easiest way to troubleshoot is to look at the actual code. Um, and one of the reasons I work at Automox is to help make it easy to solve problems and automate problems. Automox offers low code, no code, and well, full on code solutions within our platform. So policies can be set up graphically to run on certain days to make sure specified software is up to date. Um, we also have Automox worklets, which are automation scripts. And a worklet is an automation script written in Bash or PowerShell designed for seamless execution on endpoints at scale within the Automox platform. So worklet automation scripts perform configuration, remediation, and the installation or removal of applications and settings across Windows, Mac, OS, and Linux. One of the nice things about worklets is that the deployment is centralized within the Automox console. You can write the script, deploy the script in the console, and push it to all of your endpoints. Um, you can write your own worklet in native Bash or PowerShell and then push it out to all those endpoints, or you can just dip into the worklet catalog and search over 350 pre-built automation scripts to plug and play into your environment. So we've covered algorithms, no code and low code solutions. And next we're going to talk about APIs real quick. So again, while not as much of a buzzword as the other topics we've touched on, APIs are frequently misunderstood, but very useful. So API stands for application programming interface, but what does that mean? So I always like to use metaphors and using an API can be like dining at a restaurant. So just as the address of the restaurant guides you to where you'll be eating, an API endpoint directs you to the service you wish to access. The menu, you go to a restaurant, you get a menu. The menu represents the API documentation outlining the available operations and parameters, much like a menu list, the dishes and ingredients. So your request is kind of like placing an order with a waiter who takes your request to the kitchen. A request involves sending a packet along with an API key to authenticate and process your order. For example, only the wait staff can get through the staff only door. You can't go to the kitchen and place your own order. The kitchen receives this information, prepares the data or service, and then pushes the response back to you. So this structured process ensures that you get exactly what you need, just as you'd expect at a well-managed restaurant. In IT automation, APIs are useful for allowing different programs to communicate with each other and share data. So they're crucial parts of connecting the different parts of your IT management suite. Uh, for example, at Automox, if you use Automox and you are also a Rapid7 customer, uh, we have tie-ins with their API where you can automate the pulling and pushing of 
data instead of having to manually import it. Um, this saves a lot of time and being able to automate the transfer of data between systems can save a tremendous amount of time. Again, computers don't get bored of repetitive tasks. If you have to upload a CSV file every single day, multiple times a day, that's gonna get boring. If you can automate that, if you can use an API to pull and push that information automatically, that's great. That saves you a lot of time, that saves a lot of boredom. So that's a wrap for this episode. And as always, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or anywhere else. And to close, I always like knowing where words come from. So the word algorithm comes from the name of a ninth century Persian mathematician and astronomer, al Khwarizmi. He wrote a book called al Khwarizmi on the calculation with Hindu numerals, which introduced the concepts of algebra and what would eventually be known as algorithms in the Western world. Apparently, when translated to Latin, the book started with Dixit Algorizmi, which translates to the spoke al Khwarizmi. Now, over time, algorithmi morphed into algorithm. So to close this podcast and in hopes of getting something named after me, Dixit Landon Miles. <laughs>